G'day and welcome to the channel. In today's video, I want to share the story of how I went from having a cardiac arrest and almost dying to now living on this property, running a YouTube channel and having a book published about bird photography. It's pretty crazy considering I had no interest in photography or birds prior to my near-death experience. So this story is very personal and I just want you to know a little bit more about me and where I came from and how photography changed my life. And I do hope that this story may motivate you to sort of follow your passions and do things that bring you joy and connection. For me, that's definitely photography. Let's start right back at the beginning. I was actually born in New Zealand, and yep, that's me rocking out those denim overalls and the blonde hair. So I had a wonderful childhood. I was surrounded by friends and family and plenty of love. And like every other kid in New Zealand, I dreamed of being an all black. So I actually met my now wife when I was 17, working in a supermarket. I think I was stacking frozen chickens and she was on the checkouts. She was definitely way out of my league, but I sort of took a punt, asked her to the movies, and to my surprise, she said yes. And we've been together ever since. So we moved to Australia in our 20s. We both got careers. I actually joined the New South Wales Police Force. We bought a house, you know, everything was going along as planned, but unfortunately something happened that would change the course of my life forever. So I was actually home on my days off and my wife happened to be homesick that day. It was about nine o'clock in the morning and for the next eight days, I have no memory of what happened whatsoever. I was sitting at my desk and for unknown reasons, my heart actually stopped beating and I had a cardiac arrest. I fell off the chair and I lay motionless on the floor. My wife obviously witnessed what happened and she jumped into action and she called emergency services and she started CPR. The ambos arrived and the ambos took over trying to save my life. They gave me a lot of adrenaline. They shocked me a few times. They were able to get a heartbeat, but I never remained consciousness. I was then transported to the local hospital where all the lovely men and women um, of the staff there did everything they could to save my life. Uh, my heart stopped a further 10 times whilst in this hospital and they actually put me on ice to um, sort of protect my brain. They did everything they could to stabilise me. Uh, that hospital was a little bit too small to deal with what was going on. So I was actually airlifted to a much bigger hospital in Sydney called RPA, uh, a wonderful hospital. And I was there on life support for about eight days. Um, during that time, obviously the doctors informed my family that there was a high chance that I would receive brain damage from the trauma um, and the lack of oxygen that I had experienced. Uh, thankfully, um, after those eight days, when I regained consciousness, I was pretty confused, but um, thankfully it appeared that I didn't have any actual long-term brain damage. Without getting too emotional, I don't really know how my family, my friends, my colleagues handled that time when they didn't know whether I was going to wake up or not. You know, I'm truly grateful for all that support. Obviously, my beautiful wife, um, pretty scary situation for everybody involved, but thankfully due to the amazing medical system that we have here in Australia, um, it definitely saved my life. Unfortunately, they did a number of tests and they weren't able to pinpoint exactly what caused this cardiac arrest. They call it idiopathic ventricular fibrillation, as in they've got no idea what caused it. So as a result, I've actually now got an internal defibrillator implanted in my chest, which is connected to my heart. And if my heart stops, this device will shock it um, back into a proper rhythm. Unfortunately, it didn't take too long for my heart to actually test out this defibrillator. And over the subsequent, I think, um, four years, I had six further cardiac arrests and shocks. So um, it was pretty hard to deal with, a bit of anxiety producing, not knowing whether I would have a cardiac arrest at any moment. However, thankfully, due to medication and um, just over time, I'm now very, very stable and I haven't had a cardiac arrest for about seven years. So I spent another few weeks in hospital and when I left, I'd actually lost a lot of strength in my legs and the doctors and physios suggested that I start walking around my local area. It just so happened that I was quite close to some bushland. I was in suburbia, but I went out every day and started walking around and I started to notice birds and wildlife and I thought, oh, that might be cool to actually take a photo of that. I'm not sure what twigged that, but I just had a thought. And it just so happened at the time that my wife actually had a Canon 40D, this exact 40D, and we had this 70 to 200 for portraits and for people, but I'd never really taken photos of wildlife or birds prior to that. So I took this kit on a walk with me one day, and this is where it all started. A magpie actually landed on a fence post. I was probably in full auto. I've just picked up the camera, sort of looked at the magpie, took a shot, happened to look on the back of the camera, and I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, the, we can see the magpie, it's there. And I just started to take photos of the birds that I was seeing on my walks. And it didn't take too long before I couldn't identify what these birds were. So my next step was obviously to buy a bird book. And then I'd go through the bird book trying to find the bird that I'd photographed. And it kind of snowballed from there. I was just photographing these birds, trying to identify them. And all of a sudden, 
I'd started to really anticipate going for these walks, taking the camera with me, and I was enjoying this process of trying to identify these birds. But unfortunately, I made that mistake of looking at my photos and then looking at the photos online. And I quickly realized that my photos were terrible. <laughs> they were just absolutely rubbish. And something inside me wanted to take better photos. So the biggest help that I got when I started was I joined a forum called Feathers and Photos. This was pre-social media days. On that forum, you could post a photo and get constructive criticism. And I got lots of constructive criticism, and that's how I learned. So I happened to notice a few of these members lived in my area. I reached out to them, sent them an email, and thankfully a few of them agreed to let me tag along and learn from them. The first session I distinctly remember was I met up with Hein de Kock and Matthew Jones at a local beach. And the first thing I saw was them get down into the mud, take, get their cameras only inches off the ground. I remember thinking, what are they doing? They're crazy, I'm not getting down there. But of course I just copied what they did and I didn't realize I had an affinity for the mud and I've enjoyed crawling around on my belly ever since. People often ask how you stay motivated. Well, it's because I enter this sort of flow state. When I'm taking photos of birds and I'm out in the field, all my anxieties, all my worries just dissipate. I'm not thinking about anything else. And after these sessions, I'd be driving home and I'd enter this weird sense of euphoria where I'm just reflecting on the session and just, you know, in this really amazing state. I'm not sure if any of you have experienced this, but I definitely experience that when I'm out with my camera. And over the following years, I spent many wonderful outings with a lot of my friends. I went to New Zealand with Matt and Hine and we photographed the critically endangered Takahe and a few other different birds. And it's just been an absolutely wonderful hobby and pastime for me. So Matt was a massive inspiration to me. His natural curiosity and his love for the natural world was intoxicating and he knew everything there was to know and we had so many conversations we would sit in coffee shops for hours after our sessions just chatting about birds and life in general sadly um, matt developed a, a very rare tumor and he passed away in 2018 um, i distinctly remember that you know even though matt got sick it didn't let him stop his passion for photography and i remember a number of sessions we had and one memory was we actually went for a trip up to the blue mountains and we met up with another mate gerard and we had the most wonderful time photographing these gang gang cockatoos matt was sick at the time but he didn't let him stop him you know getting out there and photographing these birds and we have these photos to remember him by during this time matt was actually approached by a publisher and the publisher wanted to produce a book with matt and matt was just over the moon and of course he said yes and he started collating these images to create this book but unfortunately he got too ill and he was unable to complete the book before he passed away so his lovely wife nat actually approached me and together we decided that we would actually complete the book in matt's honor so I was extremely humbled when they asked whether I'd be interested in having some of my images in the book as well. So I've ended up um, collating a lot of Matt's images, my images, and I've written all the text. Thankfully, a lot of Matt's images, I was actually there with him. So the culmination of this work has now been published in this book called Australian Birds and Pictures. It's pretty much jam-packed full of bird shots you're going to see of Australian birds in a heap of different environments. We've got a number of different chapters um, from the outback to the garden to the beach and I'm very proud of the one we have on threatened species and a lot of the birds are in here such as the orange belly parrot, the regent honey eater, we've, we've got the eastern curlew, we've got a number of different birds. Now this book is available um, online through the book depository, uh, it's got free shipping, it will take quite some time I think up towards six weeks and I'm not sure exactly how many copies they have so but if you do purchase this book i'm very very grateful for that and thank you for the support i hope you enjoy um, all of these pictures and the hard work that was put in to create it so the next chapter in this story is how did i end up here on this property in northeast victoria well in 2018 my wife and i went for a road trip inland australia and we stayed at this airbnb in the country and we were both sitting there looking out at the bush and thinking this is what we want this is the lifestyle that we want so i actually was sitting on the toilet at that airbnb I've pulled up my um, iPad and I've just started searching for real estate, more than 50 acres next to a national park that's within our price range. And to my surprise, the exact property we were after popped up. It's a small two bedroom cottage, 125 acres next to a national park. I've actually rang the agent right there and then and said, is this place still available? Can we see it the next day? And she said, yes, we drove six hours the next day to get down to this property. We looked at the property, a week later, we put in an offer and we bought it. The crazy thing was we didn't have any jobs, we hadn't sold our house, um, you know, we just took that leap of faith that it would work out. And it did work out. Unfortunately, I actually had to resign from my role in the police because I couldn't secure a transfer. We sold our house, we sold most of our belongings and we drove six hours to this new property and we sort of started our life again. 
I was very fortunate that I actually found employment in road safety education, which is something that's dear to my heart. And I actually now travel around the state and I visit schools and talk to young people and old people all about road safety. And I still do that to this day and that is my main source of income. So I'd started thinking about YouTube long before I uploaded my first video. And I'm sure many of you may be sitting at home wondering about YouTube as well. I think I was filled with quite a lot of apprehension and doubt that anyone would actually want to watch my videos and whether I could actually do it. It wasn't until my good mate Jan actually started his own channel and he gave me some encouragement to start my own. So I thought, why not? In January 2020, I uploaded my first video and like any new YouTuber, it didn't get a lot of views and didn't get a lot of traction. And as I was uploading more and more videos, um, the traction started to grow. And thankfully, you know, it's just grown over time. And we're at a point now, this is crazy. I can't quite believe this. I've just passed 2 million views which you know, is ridiculous. And we've got 32,000 subscribers. I'm extremely grateful for the YouTube platform, which has obviously connected me with you. And I really do sincerely hope that you're enjoying the content and finding it useful. So now I just wanna answer a few questions that you had about me and the channel. And I'm just gonna group them into the, the most popular questions that I had. So the first one is, do you make a living from YouTube? Do you make a living from wildlife photography? I think many of you probably want to get into a career of photographing wildlife or photography in general. Uh, for me personally, photography has never been my career or my main source of income. I've always had a day job, still have a day job, and photography has always been a hobby for me and a passion. Um, very difficult to make money out of selling wildlife photos or anything like that. I did actually, um, on the weekends, I had a market store where I sold cards and prints and different things, and I did enjoy that, a lot of work, and it was more pocket money than anything. But pre-YouTube, didn't really make a heck of a lot of money from wildlife photography. Obviously now with YouTube, the income is slowly growing, but it's nowhere near enough to survive on. So for the time being, I'm gonna have my day job and do YouTube as the hobby or on, on the side. I'm very grateful because YouTube has now allowed me the income I get from that. I've bought the R5, I've bought the 100 to 500, I've bought the R6, and I'm buying a few lenses and doing different reviews. Without YouTube, I'm not sure that would have been possible. So a great question I get is just how much time do you spend on YouTube? How long does it take to create a video? And it really does vary from video to video and person to person. For me personally, I probably spend about 20 to 30 hours a week on YouTube, pretty much all my spare time. And my last video, the RF 100 to 400 review, that was a really long video. I probably spent, I don't know, 60 to 80 hours creating that video. I went out into the field probably four or five times. I've processed 43 photos, I think. I've had to write a script, I've had to film the A-roll, I've had to film the B-roll, I've had to edit it all together, upload it, and do all those things. I guess the good thing for me is I enjoy the process. It doesn't feel like work to me, it's actually quite enjoyable, so I have no issue um, investing that time into creating those videos. I've got to ask what my goals are for the channel. Really, I just want to continue to make content that's helpful, entertaining, and educational. And I also want to continue to grow our community. We've got such a wonderful comment section on my videos. You know, a lot of YouTube comment sections aren't very good, but ours is very good and I'm very proud of that. And I want to continue fostering that. Um, for me, I don't want to put any pressure on myself to reach a certain number of views or subscribers or make X amount of money. That doesn't interest me whatsoever. I just want to continue to improve and create videos and I believe all that stuff will just take care of itself. So a really interesting question I got was my progression as a photographer. People see, want to see a lot of my early photos and where did I start from and where have I got to? So what I might do is actually share with you the photos that I've taken from the very beginning, which is 2011 until now, and we can see the difference in the photos and how I've changed. So if we look at my very first photo that I shared earlier was this Australian magpie on the fence post. That was taken in November 2011 on a 40D and the 70 to 200. 10 months later, I took this photo of a splendid fairy wren with a 7D and a 405.6. How did I go from that magpie to that splendid fairy wren in 10 months? Well, there's three key things that allowed me to do that. The first one, I took lots of photos, and I mean lots of photos. I was out in the field every spare chance I got. In that 10 months, I estimate I had around 80 sessions. 80 times I've gone out, taken photos, failed, learned, gone back, taken photos. And I even went on a few trips where I was taking photos morning and night, you know, every day. So over that time, I don't know how many hours I put in or how many photos I took, but it was a lot. And that's how I sort of learned. The second thing was I actually had those mentors. So I had Hein and Matt helping me the entire time. And I went on a few trips um, with Hein and we learned a lot from each other. And the third thing was all the constructive criticism that I got on that forum. 
you know, I think those forums back in the day are a lot more helpful than the social media we get today where everyone just likes your images and they don't really give you any constructive criticism. So those three things that sort of turbocharged my learning and allowed me to go from that magpie to that splendid furry wren. So let's go through a timeline of all my images. Let's start with 2011. This is a shot I took with the 40D and 70-200, a yellow tufted honey eater and a eucalypt. Not a terrible shot, but I still had a lot to learn. The next shot I want to share was actually sort of early 2012, and this is the first photo I ever took where I went, wow, I'm impressed with that. I really like that shot, and I knew I was on the right path. And this was of these pied oyster catchers. I really love this behavior. You know, I got down low. We've got two oyster catchers changing that other oyster catcher. We've got the Pacific Golden Plovers in the background. Just overall, I just really like this photo, and I still love this photo today, and this was, what, 10 years ago. So 2013 rolled around, and I started to get interested in seabird photography or pelagic photography. I've jumped on a boat, I've gone out to the shelf, and you've got all these albatross and all these other birds, and it's just a wonderful way to practice your bird in flight. And I got this shot of a shy albatross as it's just skimming along the water. And this was taken, I think it was with the 7D and the 405.6, but it was just that smooth water, um, this, everything about this shot, I just love it. So in 2014, I'd been going for three years and it was time for me to invest in some better gear. I actually found and bought this 500 F4 second hand. I think I paid about seven grand for it, which I could probably get today. So it really hasn't lost a lot of value. And then I also bought the Canon 5D Mark III, my first full frame body. So it was this combination that upped my images. And this first image here that I really love with this kit is one of my favorite images of all time are these black wing stilts. This opposing image, you know, everything about it, I just love it. And it was obviously that kit that sort of enabled that shot. 2015, on my trip to New Zealand with Matt and Hine, we encountered these little rye bills feeding in the mud and they were pulling these worms out of the mud. And I just love this shot because you've got the little bird just pulling as hard as it can, pulling that worm out of the ground. A really, really good shot. 2016 rolled around and this was probably my most successful and enjoyable session I have ever had. The weather was absolutely perfect. The water was shallow. It was flat, no wind. We had beautiful sunlight. We had beautiful reflections on the water. I laid down in the water and all these birds just came to me and were just feeding around me. It was absolutely incredible. And I nailed a heap of shots, but this one here stands out to me of a little redneck stint. I just love the reflection. I love the ripple in the water. This one will stay with me forever, this shot. Uh, 2017 was a bit of a quieter year for me. I didn't actually get out as much as I would have liked, but I did get down to Tasmania and I was able to witness a massive migration of short-tailed shearwaters. It was just incredible. The sky was sort of filled with these birds. And, you know, I tried to capture as best I could all of these birds with, um, you know, it's a slightly wider, slightly different shot, but one that I'm very proud of. 2018, I finally got to photograph a bird I'd always wanted to photograph, and that was the pink robin. And yes, this bird is real. That color is real. Uh, I had a wonderful session with a heap of mates, and we all got the shots of this bird, and we're all so ecstatic. And, you know, I'm very, very happy with the shot. So 2019 rolled around, a very cold morning with a couple of mates out in the middle of the outback and we photographed these beautiful Mallee ringnecks. I just sort of love the over the shoulder pose and that tail spread, a great image. Uh, 2020, uh, I just started YouTube and I actually got a message from a subscriber alerting me to a sacred kingfisher. I've gone down and I've managed to photograph it and got this shot of the sacred kingfisher with a massive spider. It's just something unique about this shot, one I really, really do enjoy. Um, last year, 2021, a pretty busy year reviewing gear and it was whilst I was reviewing the Sigma 150 to 600 that I actually took the shot of a sulfur crested cockatoo. There's just something about this shot which I really do like. You know, we've got that dark background, we've got the bird flying. Overall, very, very happy with this image. Hopefully all these shots I just shared with you shows the sort of my, you know, progression as a photographer. And it all comes down to time in the field, as I mentioned earlier. The fact that I've gone to all these places, taken all these photos, obviously increases my odds of getting these sorts of shots. Uh, the last question I get asked a lot about is my processing. And obviously processing is a really integral part of the digital workflow. I am going to do a video in the future showing exactly how I process my photos because I believe many of you will find this helpful. I'm all self-taught. I've just learned through watching YouTube videos. I use Lightroom for my raw conversion and I use Photoshop for the final touches. And if you are actually in Australia in May, I'm actually attending the BirdLife Photography Conference and I will be giving a talk about uh, Lightroom and sort of image processing. So be sure to check that out if you live in Australia. So I hope you enjoyed my story and you learned something about me. If you've got any further questions, leave them in the comments below. I will read them. 
Thanks again to the members that directly support the channel. Thank you to everybody that watches these videos. I really do appreciate all the support. Be sure to get out there in the field, enjoy your photography, take care, and I'll see you in the next one.